Hello, my name is Anisha Freeman. I'm also known as the locksmith because I make keys for locks in the mind. Welcome to episode one of my podcast. Today's episode is entitled Improving Productivity at Staff Meetings. This episode is for managers, supervisors, and leaders. So how are we going to improve productivity? By addressing dysfunctional, unconscious beliefs, beliefs that impede productivity at staff meetings. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have a bachelor's degree in business studies. I have a master's degree in business administration. I have a master's degree in social work. I was the personal assistant to the mayor of Grand Rapids for three years, the Honorable Reverend George K. Hartwell. He's retired now, but I was his assistant for three years and I went to a lot of meetings. <laughs> My specialty is cognitive restructuring, meaning I introduce people to dysfunctional, unconscious beliefs that make decisions for them without their conscious awareness. I created a program, an award-winning program by the name of The Lies That Buy. I have a youth model and an adult model. My work has been featured on PBS on the Inner Compass show. I served as the clinical director at two organizations, and I've also served on various community boards and committees, meaning I spent a lot of time in meetings and I have led directed meetings. So during my podcast, all of them in the series, you will hear me use various terms. I'm going to use the terms issues, unaddressed issues, lies, and dysfunctional unconscious beliefs interchangeably. Whenever you hear me use those terms, I'm referring to dysfunctional unconscious beliefs that cause people to engage in self-defeating behaviors repeatedly despite the consequences. Most of these beliefs are totally antithetical to what people consciously know, believe, and articulate. I say most because some people who struggle with perfectionism, they are aware of that issue. They may not be aware that there's various unconscious beliefs up under the umbrella of perfectionism, but they are aware that they struggle with believing that they have to get it right the first time. And although they make statements like, if you're not going to do it right the first time, then don't do it. They don't really believe that. Because if that's the case, then they should have no problem hiring a novice caterer for their wedding reception. These are unconscious beliefs. Now, people who struggle with what I've nicknamed as the blame throwing belief, <laughs> they may not be aware of it at all. That unconscious belief is blame others for your action or actions or your inaction. People, people may not be aware even slightly that that's what they're doing. And it's hard to fight an invisible enemy. That's where the power of these issues or beliefs lies in their unknown property. And Freud, Sigmund Freud's theory was that in order to help people, you have to bring the information in the unconscious mind to people's conscious awareness. I have different techniques than Freud, but I believe in his theory. So how do these beliefs make their way into people's unconscious mind? Well, it's usually during the formative years. I say usually because there's always exceptions to the rule. So these beliefs are programmed into people's minds by how they are treated and by what they observe during those critical foundation years. Now, some beliefs also act as a landing pad that flag in other dysfunctional beliefs. For example, if a person was programmed with the belief people are only tolerating you, that belief can flag in the belief you have to compensate for your presence with goods and services. It's what I call the therefore factor. People are only tolerating you. Therefore, you have to compensate for your presence with goods and services. So the belief that we're going to talk about today that's famous for hijacking productivity at staff meetings is criticize and complain, but don't seek solution. I've nicknamed this belief the problem-focused dysfunctional unconscious belief. It's time-consuming, 
and it hinders productivity at meetings. It's unconscious. People who struggle with this belief wouldn't walk into a staff meeting and say, good morning, everyone. I'm getting ready to criticize and complain. I'm going to tie up the agenda, talking about problems over and over again. It's unconscious. People who are afflicted by this belief, they discuss problems continuously, usually at every meeting. They introduce different problems or variations of the same problems at every meeting. They get indignant if they are interrupted by someone who offers a solution. They have a problem for every solution that is offered. They encourage others to engage in problem-focused discussions. Now, let's talk about how this belief was programmed into someone's unconscious mind during the formative years. Usually, it's via observation. So if a child is raised in an environment in which he or she witnessed others talk about the same problems over and over and over and over, the belief was created, criticize and complain, but don't seek solutions. It was found in their mind under, what do you do with the problem? You talk about it. You talk about it over and over again. And so that's how the belief made its entry into a person's unconscious mind. Well, what's the solution? Dr. R. Joseph, a noted expert in the fields of neuroscience and psychology, he says that the way out for individuals who were raised in these circumstances, circumstances in which dysfunctional unconscious beliefs were programmed into their mind, is to become educated. It, they have to become educated about the alternatives available, a different belief system, a more functional approach to life. However, Dr. Joseph says they must also be able to scrutinize their own lives so as to recognize the maladaptive self-destructive patterns they've been engaging in. It would be very difficult for them to change their behavior if they cannot recognize it so as to avoid it. If a person is not aware that they're criticizing and complaining and not seeking solution, it's hard for them to stop. If a person is not aware that they're blaming others for their actions or their lack of taking action, they didn't take action, they can't stop it if they're not aware of it. So here's the functional belief. Criticizing, complaining, and talking about the problem repeatedly makes you look unprofessional and incompetent. In business, most problems are time sensitive. Problems are expensive. While you're talking about the problem, time and money are evaporating. In addition, the unsolved dilemma may be costing you key personnel. Your competitor may not suffer with this issue. They may be doing a SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats analysis of your tendencies and your unsolved problems. Find other ways to get your adrenaline, adrenaline rush besides going on and on and on about the same problem. Some people get an adrenaline rush talking about problems. Follow the well-known problem-solving strategy. Number one, identify the problem. Number two, make sure it's not a symptom. Number three, generate three possible solutions. Number four, Pick the best one or vote on the best one. Number five, implement the solution. Number six, evaluate how the implemented solution is working. If it's not working, go back to step three and select another solution. Let's talk more action. Be the professional you say you are on your website and business card. Now I wanna go back and talk about step two in the problem solving model. Make sure it's not a symptom. So a good example is I did some consultation work for a company and one of the problems that the supervisors, I did a training for supervisors, they were talking about a problem that kept happening at the company. These expensive machines kept breaking down and it was very costly to have them repaired. And in some cases they had to be replaced. So as we were talking about dysfunctional unconscious beliefs, the supervisors begin admitting 
that they struggled with some beliefs that were causing problems, causing the staff, the employees to be afraid to say, hey, I don't know how to use this machine. The training was not adequate. The, the supervisors struggled with the beliefs. People have to figure everything out by themselves. Other people should automatically possess the same information you possess, or that means they're incompetent and the belief people have to get it right the first time. See, the, the supervisors were in a training where they were made to feel very comfortable because I would throw myself under the bus talking about all the dysfunctional unconscious beliefs I had to work through and gave real life examples. So they felt safe to talk about the fact that, yeah, we're unapproachable. We, we do the training, but the training apparently is not adequate for these new employees and they're breaking these machines. And because we're coming across as unapproachable, they're afraid to tell us, hey, I really don't know what I'm doing. I heard something go pop in this machine. So instead of them coming and telling the supervisor, I think, I, I think this machine, I think I did something wrong. They just kept using the machines because the supervisors were unapproachable. That was the problem. Inadequate training and unapproachable supervisors. But initially they thought the problem was these machines keep breaking. Okay, so that's why it's important to separate the problem from the symptom. And so managers, leaders, and supervisors are supposed to direct traffic at staff meetings. So when they have people in the meeting, and hopefully the managers, supervisors, and leaders are not the people afflicted by the criticize and complain, but don't seek solution issue. In some cases, they are. So if, if you're a leader, a manager, a supervisor, and you're afflicted, then I'm talking directly to you. But if you direct traffic at meetings and you have people in the meetings that have this issue, here's how to solve them, how, how to address it. <laughs> and so you can use these techniques on yourself if you're the one that's afflicted by the belief. So when a person is discussing the problems repeatedly, make sure you have an agenda with time allocated to agenda, agenda items. I put a question on social media asking people, what is the number one issue that you believe hinders productivity at staff meetings? I received so many answers. It's almost like I looked across the room and looked back and I had a, a lot of comments. I'm like, whoa, people have never responded to a question that I posted on social media that quickly. And a lot of these people were in administration. Some were at nonprofits, but some of these people worked at companies like Fortune 500 companies. And they said, lack of agenda. That was one of the issues that kept popping up. I was shocked. I just assumed that most people know you have to have an agenda, but make sure you have time allocated to the agenda items. Use the problem solving model that we just discussed. Allocate a specific amount of time to vent and talk about the problem. Sometimes people need to vent because they're overwhelmed, but the whole meeting should not be a vent session. If a problem has gone on for a long time, you may have to allocate a meeting to people venting, but the next meeting should be using the problem solving model to address the reasons people need to vent. Make sure to emphasize the need to separate the problem from the symptom and practice shutting down the criticizing complainers in a professional manner. So, you can't say, shut up. So you may have to say, thank you, Chuck, or thank you, Mary, <laughs> using certain vocal tones of voice inflections to let them know that you're going to have to stop talking now. And so when the criticizing complainers try to introduce different problems or variations of the same problem at the meeting, have a focus for the meeting. So we're focusing on this one problem today and we're gonna use the problem solving model. Identify the problems that will be the focus and we're not gonna talk about these other problems, we'll address them at another meeting. Call on specific people to ask and ask for their input so that the people who like to criticize and complain don't monopolize the meeting. 
and give people a certain amount of time to speak. I do that as a therapist when I'm doing family sessions. I do that when I'm doing groups, when I'm leading group sessions. I tell people when I'm doing presentations on Clubhouse, when people when I invite people to the stage, I tell them exactly how much time they have. And I give them a sign when their time is coming to an end. And when they get indignant, when the criticizing complainer gets indignant, if they are interrupted by someone who offers a solution, don't allow them to shut the solution focused staff member down. Say no, when they try to interrupt the person who's offering a solution, stop them, say no, let them talk. I, we wanna hear their solution. We wanna hear their recommendation for a solution. When they keep trying to offer a problem for every solution, allocate, make sure they have a specific amount of time to complain. Because some of their complaints are valid and they actually can become continuous quality improvement specialists because the people who like to criticize and complain, they can walk through your company and find everything that's wrong. They're gathering, they're gathering data for the meeting. So use them, but you have to control how they use their gift. <laughs> It's actually a gift if they can spot what's wrong instantly, but instead of allowing them to use their gift in an inappropriate, inefficient manner, remember managers, supervisors, and leaders direct tra traffic, harness their gift, give them a certain amount of time, then move forward with the problem solving model. Encourage others to engage in problem-focused discussion. The criticizers and complainers are famous for encouraging others to criticize and complain. It's contagious. So ask those who have connected to the complainers' energy, energy for their thoughts on possible solutions. Have solution-focused quotes framed on the wall and refer to the quotes from time to time. Establish and maintain a solution-focused culture. Send out congratulations to people and give out incentives to people who solve problems at your company or your organization. So that's all for episode one. Be sure to check out my second episode, Increasing Productivity by Reducing Staff Burnout. If you'd like to, more information about my work, you can visit my website at anishaconsulting.com. Anisha is spelled A-N-N-E-S-H-I-A, -E anishaconsulting.com. I can also be reached via email at afreeman at anishaconsulting.com. I'm also a motivational speaker, and I have a website that features videos and talks about my motivational presentations. That website is anishaspeaks.com. So thank you for attending my very first podcast and episode one in my very first podcast. I'll see you next week. <laughs>